أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تطغوا في الميزان وأقيموا الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسروا الميزان والأرض وضعها للأنام فيها فاكهة والنخل ذات الأكمام والحب ذو العصف والريحان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان صدق الله العظيم In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. The all merciful has taught the Quran. He created humankind and he has taught eloquent speech. The sun and the moon to a reckoning, and the stars and the trees bow themselves. And heaven, he raised it up and set the balance. Transgress, transgress not in the balance, and weigh with justice, and skimp not in the balance. And earth, he set it down for all beings. Therein fruits and palm trees with sheaths, and grain in the blade and fragrant herbs. Oh, which of your Lord's bounties will you and you deny? Imam Zaid, Imam Daoud, respected guests and participants, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Greetings of peace. On behalf of Zaytuna College and with these ayat of the Quran from Surah Ar-Rahman, the All Merciful, I welcome you to the launch of an experiential environmental workshop, a four-day program directed by Imam Daoud Yasin and chaired by Dr. Salim Ali, who will be joining us tomorrow. Zaytuna is happy to be hosting this workshop in partnership with the University of Vermont's Institute for Environmental Diplomacy and Security and the Graduate Theological Union's Center for Islamic Studies. The ultimate goal of any educational institution should be to nurture individuals, not simply as means to someone else's ends, but to be ends in themselves. At Zaytuna, we like to say that our education is not about making a living. It is preparation for a life worth living. It is ultimately in this way that we will better society, further the common good, and make the world more hospitable for our children. This imperative lies at the heart of an institution such as the GTU as well, whose very motto declares that Holy Hill is a place where religion meets the world. And the mission of Zaytuna College is to educate and prepare morally committed, professional, intellectual, and spiritual leaders who are grounded in the Islamic scholarly tradition and conversant with the cultural currents and critical ideas shaping modern society. It is for the training and nurturing of leaders that we are gathered here today. It is indeed our pleasure to welcome participants from across the United States, leaders in their respective institutions already, to spend the week with us. Catherine Piper from Islamic Society of Boston Cultural Center in Massachusetts. Muhammad Aftab Diwan from Brighter Horizons Academy in Texas. Bertina Naba from Nashville International Academy in Tennessee. Azra Ali, Huda School in Michigan, Hajira Himayatullah and Sayyid Amanullah from Crescent Academy International, also in Michigan, from Michigan. And from right here in the Bay Area, Salwa Abid from North Star School, 
Muniza Ahsan from Peace Terrace Academy, Muna Nazar from Silicon Valley Academy. Ahlan wa sahlan. We trust that Berkeley, the GTU, and Zaytuna will find a cozy place in your hearts. This is not only one of the most vibrant intellectual centers of the country, it also has a thriving and diverse Muslim population. Countless halal stores and houses of curry, dood pati, and some of the best weather of any place on earth. Send us your students to study here. Before I introduce Imam Daud Yassin to tell us a little more about the workshop, and also to introduce Imam Zaid, let me thank the many people who contributed to making this event possible. And there are a lot of people to thank. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Salim Ali, professor at the University of Vermont and director of the University's Institute for Environmental Diplomacy and Security. Dr. Salim contacted me last year on the recommendation of Imam Daoud with his vision for this workshop. Most importantly, his institution and network of sponsors and donors are funding the entire program. Thank you, Dr. Salim. In spite of the many tasks and priorities for the hardworking Zaytuna staff in its inaugural years, such as curriculum design, accreditation, the building of an endowment, and purchase of a permanent campus, which we managed to accomplish and is right next door, the college's Academic Affairs Committee was enthusiastic about the program and eager to facilitate its success. We appreciate the support of the college's administration in promoting the event. A special note of thanks to Sumaira Akhtar, our dedicated academics program manager. Her brothers from all the way in Chicago and DC have also contributed. Usman is responsible for designing the lovely poster and bookmarks that you see. And Rizwan is representing Green Muslims as a presenter. You will hear from him shortly. We have also been blessed with two wonderful volunteers who the participants will be seeing all week. Aaron Choi, president of the Green Khalifa Club. That's a club at Zaytuna College. Aaron, raise your hand. Thank you, Aaron. Remarkable individual. He's been doing tremendous work. And also Rawan Abu Shaban, an accomplished freshman at UC Berkeley and active volunteer at the local masjid. Rawan's sister Noor is also here today to help. Thank you to all the volunteers. Thanks also to the many community members who have pitched in for lunches and dinners throughout the week. Amina Jandali, Babar and Shama Khan, Abbas and Ruxana Mirza, my parents, <laughs> as well as the business Cream and Cheese and Stuff Delhi. Ibi Bai and Halima, wonderful family friends and longtime supporters of the GTU, are not only providing a dinner for the participants on Friday, they've also catered this reception through their new venture, Kokum Cuisine. Thanks to them. A warm note of appreciation for Phil Pasquini. He's the one, not quite walking around yet, but with the impressive camera, almost as impressive as his mustache. <laughs> I asked him if I could say that. He said yes. <laughs> Which he has used with great skill, not the mustache, the camera, <laughs> for the publishing of his book on the history of Islamic-inspired buildings in America. The book is entitled Domes, Arches, and Minarets. You can see his book and browse other items of local interest, brochures for GTU and the Center for Islamic Studies in the room next door. Um, we also like to thank Musa Sarari for the sound system and recording. Most importantly, I'd like to thank the program co-chair, Stephanie Mirza. In case you're wondering, there is a relationship. She stepped in to support the project as a volunteer at a critical time and coordinated various logistical tasks, including hotels, flights, ground transportation, orientation, food, venues, volunteers, and facilitated contacts with local partners and the media. As Imam Daud said last night, <laughs> late last night, after another 12-hour day, this program would not have happened without her. Seriously, man, that's real talk. <laughs> Where is she? OK. Thanks, Stephanie. We're grateful. But the irony is this, that these words actually apply to Imam Daoud himself. Imam Daoud is a towering personality, literally and metaphorically. He's currently working on his graduate degree in environmental studies at Dartmouth while serving as the college's Muslim chaplain. He also coordinates several uh, service learning trips overseas. He has taught at Zaytuna's Summer Arabic Intensive multiple times, hunts deer in the wilderness, supports a loving family that has just seen the addition of a precious new member. 
and wishes for his children a world purer than the one he finds himself in. That is why he does what he does, and that is why he is here. Please, please join me in welcoming the orchestrator, Imam Daoud Yassin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا مولانا سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم اجعلنا من المخلصين اللهم اجعلنا من المخلصين اللهم اجعلنا من المخلصين السلام عليكم and greetings, and greetings of peace to all of you i recited a verse uh, of the quran here which is uh, my lord um, open my breast and you know, make my affair easy for me and uh, allow my tongue to speak, which people will be able to understand and ask for God to, to make us of people of sincerity. Um, you know, mashallah, I've had a great relationship with Mahan uh, and his family. I knew them from the days when he was pursuing his uh, PhD at Yale. We overlapped in New Haven for years uh, there. And I told him, uh, listen, Mahan, when you become a big uh, doctor, Saab, just make sure that you give me a job somewhere. So, <laughs> alhamdulillah, my dua was answered. MashaAllah. So, um, as Mahan mentioned, alhamdulillah, Dr. Salim had uh, reached out to me and uh, had asked me about this uh, idea. His work, obviously, is around the environment. It's something that I'm passionate about. It's something that I grew up. Uh, with uh, before my conversion, I was you know gonna enjoy everything from water sports to, to hiking and camping, and being in the mountains, and all of these things. And afterwards, kind of felt that you know perhaps that wasn't shared with people now um, that 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 I was engaging with uh, as Muslims, and I found that kind of odd given how the Quran speaks over and over and over and over again about the relationship. Um, that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala vis-a-vis the creation. So that was something that was of interest to me. So Dr. Salim reached out to me, um, and obviously his work, as I said, is around this, and, and he was saying similar things, that even at kind of uh, on an intellectual level, or on a, uh, a policy level, or on an academic level, um, with regard to, to, to our uh, Islamic schools here, that this was something that was actually off the radar. So his idea was how can we bring a group of people together to at least begin to discuss, begin to discuss this issue or these issues, which really are zero sum, you know, on, on, uh, on one level and should be uh, of the utmost importance uh, to all of us. So that's kind of, in a, you know, in a nutshell, how all of this came together. And then, alhamdulillah, Allah, you know, facilitated all of this to happen. And he asked for, you know, who did he think we should think we should partner with? And for me, I said it was a no, a no-brainer, which is easy for me. Um, <laughs> so uh, we partnered with Zaytuna, and here we are on this evening at this uh, wonderful event. Uh, I'm not going to 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 take any more time here. But the person that I would like to 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 mention is. Uh, someone that is truly an inspiration for me on so many levels. And this uh, individual, um, who you all know, um, he and I have a very interesting uh, relationship in that before I was Muslim, he was my professor of, 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 of political science uh, in Connecticut. And then I ended up leaving the college and I you know, converted six years later, and then we met. We met. This is incredible. We met by the grace of Allah, in Damascus, on the fourth floor of a building at Salatul Vohr. And I said, well, that looks like Professor Shaka. <laughs> but what would he be doing here? <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Carried on my Salat, and SubhanAllah, then from that day, I, you know, we met, and we were, we've been together. But again, I said on so many fronts, you know, as a scholar, as a, as a human being, as a practitioner of this religion with compassion and mercy, and I can go on and on and on and on, but also on a pragmatic level. When we left, you know, Damascus and moved back to New Haven, and I was there as his assistant imam for the time that he was there before coming uh, to Zaytuna, you know, in the middle of what we will call the hood, he's growing vegetables. 
And everyone's talking about we can't wait for the kale, we can't wait for the tomatoes, we can't wait for the cucumbers. In an area where recycling probably was understood as some form of like transportation, you know, it sounds like bicycle or something like this, right? It just wasn't known. Right? This is something that was not known. And this is, you know, then we were able to start campaigns and then cleanups and it spreads out from there. And so when you meet someone like this that has a passion for this, that has a commitment to the dean, um, then what I'm going to do is be quiet and let you hear from him. So without any further ado, inshallah ta'ala, I'd like to introduce uh, Imam Zaid Shakir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala Sayyidin Mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. First of all, we'd like to thank the organizers, Dr. Salim, Imam Daoud, uh, Dr. Mirza, his wife, Stephanie. She's, she's a legendary part of this program. Uh, and, and many, many others. Uh, it's, it's the bad part about beginning to name names. You always leave someone out. So uh, the list is very long. We have Zaytuna College students volunteering here, UC Berkeley students. Uh, the presenters who've come from as far away as Australia, Imam Afroz Ali, uh, academics, activists, teachers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut, I was actually 45 miles away when that happened. We were there for a, f a funeral of a dear, dear friend of ours. And we were so preoccupied with the funeral, we didn't even realize what had happened until much, much later in the day. But uh, that tragedy, one thing it, it highlighted uh, was the heroism of our teachers. And it shouldn't take a tragedy. This is something that is known to most of us. And it shouldn't take a tragedy for it to really be highlighted. A lot of times our teachers are maligned, uh, especially recently uh, as our political culture and political discourse degenerates. Teachers and their unions become sort of the symbol of everything that's wrong with the country in the eyes of some, which tells you what's wrong with the country. <laughs> In any case, though, uh, our teachers are he heroic uh, individuals. They sacrifice. Uh, in the Muslim community, they, they usually sacrifice for a lot less money than the teachers sacrifice for out there in the public school system. And their involvement in this program, I think that is the ingredient, that special ingredient that's really going to catalyze uh, this initiative and make it really something practical and beneficial and far-reaching. But everyone's input is critical and important. We thank all of you for coming out, all of the supportive community members. Uh, mashallah, this is area, there's always something going on. There are probably two or three other events going on this evening. And so to take time to come here, it just shows uh, that this is an idea whose time has come. And hopefully the conference, the uh, workshop this week will really galvanize uh, the energy and translate that idea into policies, into uh, practical programs and suggestions that can be implemented on the ground, inshallah ta'ala. What I like to do now is I like to just mention a few verses from the Quran just to uh, point out how as Muslims we're being oriented by our Lord towards ecological consciousness. And this is something integral to our religion. And historically, it's something that happened by way of, by way of course. There, there didn't, we didn't need a concerted effort to, to focus people's attention on environmental issues. This was something that the religion did. And in pre-modern times, when people were more intricately uh, connected to the various realities that, whose internalization give real meaning to the religious, religion as a holistic reality, 
uh, we, didn't, we didn't have to talk about it. It was something we lived. But there was a foundation for that. And we like to focus on a few of those foundations. First of all, the Quran is calling our attention to nature. As Dr. Mahan recited uh, from Surah Rahman. And just to focus on one thing, he mentioned many things we could focus on, but he said, when, when Najmu wa Shajuru Yasdudan, that the stars and the trees are in prostration. And, and so they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And their worship is a sign of their submission. And this really emphasized how important it is for us to be in submission and to be in harmony with the trees and the stars. Allah Ta'ala reminds us, أَفَلَا يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبَلِي كَيْفَ خُلِقَاتْ وَإِلَى السَّمَاءِ كَيْفَ رُفِعَتْ وَإِلَى الْجِبَالِ كَيْفَ مُصِبَتْ وَإِلَى الْأَرْضِ كَيْفَ سُطِحَتْ Do they not look at the camel, how it's been created? So we're, our attention is called to the animal world. وَإِلَى السَّمَاءِ كَيْفَ رُفِعَتْ And our sin, attention is drawn to the celestial world. And it's called to the mountains, which in many parts of the world, they serve as a reminder to us as to just how <coughs> humble we should be. One of our scholars said, whenever you start feeling arrogant, go stand next to a mountain. You start realizing, well, I'm not so big after all. It's very humbling. And to the earth, how it's been spread out and how it's been populated with plants and species. So the animals, the, the celestial realm, the mountains, the plains, the earth, our attention is drawn to that. And then Allah Ta'ala reminds us, these are all worlds. They all have their denizens. They're the denizens of the heavens and the earth the sea, the mountains. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Our Prophet وسلم, is told, we have sent you but as a mercy to all of the worlds. And part of his mercy is his stewardship. It, it pains many of us. Uh, we had a conversation earlier mentioning how we go to the Muslim world and it's an ecological nightmare. That wasn't always the case. That wasn't always the case. There's probably no river you would be bold enough to drink from today. When we were in Syria, the Barada is now a sewer most of the year. At a time, that river provided the drinking water for the people of Damascus. It was brought down and then channeled into the neighborhoods and then there were... Uh, little uh, channels bringing it right into the homes and people were drinking from that river which was fed by the snow melting in the late spring and early summer from the mountains surrounding Damascus. This, is, this was our reality. Our cities were laid out in a way that respected the environment. If you read our books on the Hisba, the Public order, maintaining public order, the muhtasib, the officer in control of that. You'll read in the books things such as, well, build the road around the tree. Because that tree has a right to be there. The guardian of the walls. is And Imam Subki, uh, Tajuddin Subki, one of our great scholars, he has a book on the hisbah, Mu'id and Ni'am, Mamubid and Niqam, perpetuating the blessings and eliminating the things that will call you, cause you remorse or regret. In that book, he, he, he records the instructions to the person who's going to stucco the walls of the city. So in the Middle East, many of the walls were stuccoed and still they use stucco. He said, before you stucco the wall, inspect it very carefully to ensure that no birds or animals have made their nest therein. Because were you to plaster them in, I would be responsible for their death and answerable to Allah on the Day of Judgment. This is how our cities and living spaces were organized. These are the kind of instructions that our public officials were given 
at one time. So the Prophet was a mercy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, he warned a lady that she would be threatened with hell because she imprisoned a cat, she wouldn't feed the cat nor let it free to get its own food. So torturing the cat in that manner, she was threatened with hell. Another lady, because she was merciful to a dog, she was hot, she got a drink from a well, she saw a dog panting from thirst, and she said, this dog is probably as thirsty as I was. And she climbed down into the well, filled her shoe with water, climbed up and gave it to the dog to drink, and she was promised paradise for that, even though before that she was a woman of ill repute. So there are many stories how uh, some people were using a bird tied up as a target, and the Prophet ﷺ he said, don't, use a, uh, don't make a target of any living thing. If you want a target, practice shoot at the wall or a tree stump. Don't shoot at living or animals. Meaning just hunting with no intention to eat the prey. Or use it for something constructive. This is something forbidden. So little things just give an indication of the degree of consciousness and respect for life that was inculcated uh, into the believers. Allah Ta'ala mentions in Qur'an, إِنَّ الْمُبَذِّرِينَ كَانُوا أَخْوَانَ الشَّيَاطِينَ One of the major sources of our ecological crisis today is waste. Wastefulness both in production and then wastefulness in terms of how we dispose of all the stuff we're producing. And I recommend for everyone, if you haven't read it, the story of stuff, which examines both ends, the production side and the disposal side. And what goes into that? To make a, a gold band, less than an ounce of gold. Now, when most gold uh, sources are depleted, leaves 20 tons of cyanide poisoned waste. Because the gold is made by drenching the ore with cyanide. And the cyanide sucks out the gold and then the rest of the ore is just poisoned with cyanide. Um, most, most of it in South Africa, which is, is either dumped in the ocean or left in the countryside to be washed off by the rain to poison the groundwater and the crops and cattle. This is our reality, brothers and sisters. So we have to begin to be merciful to our earth, to our fellow travelers on this earth, the animals and other species that we share the earth with <clears throat> and avoid waste at all costs. Waste now is, is, pl is planned. We, uh, when I was young, I read a book called The, the Waste Makers by Vance Packard. And just examining the issue of planned obsolescence because they used to build things to last and then they quickly discovered if we build things to last, we're only going to build one. So we have to design things to break. And so they open and close a door until the hinge wore out. And if it wore out after 20,000 times, they de adjusted the metal alloy so it would be weaker and it would, the hinge would break after opening it 5,000 times. So, and this leads to our junkyards filling up with junk. And it's waste. The title of the book, The Waste Makers. And so Allah Ta'ala is telling us the waste makers are brothers of Satan. <laughs> so this should tell a believer, I can't be a waste maker. Because it's not good to be Satan's brother. If you're a believer. That's not a position you want to be in when you meet your Lord. You know, you should go over there with your brother. <laughs> oh, I have a problem. So we should be uh, advocates of con conservation, co conservative living, re recycling, reusing things. I was talking earlier, my wife, she washes tinfoil. And at one time, people laughed at her. Now she's a pioneer. <laughs> you watched him for? SubhanAllah. This, but we should take pride in these things. 
We should take, the, and those are the little things that count. I was in uh, Vancouver a couple years ago during the rainy season. We went hiking in the woods, one of my favorite pastimes. And Imam Daoud, we had many hiking adventures. He probably forgot this one. He didn't. He knows what I'm going to say. We took a classroom off in, into the snow and we lost one of the children. <laughs> And uh, Alhamdulillah, Imam Dao found him. But only after he lived up to his name. So we all, it was getting dark and the police, state police didn't get there yet. And uh, it was fresh snow on the ground. We figured we could find him very easily, just track him. But for some reason that wasn't working. <coughs> so Imam Dao said, yeah, Imam Dao said, let's read Yasin, Surah Yasin. And we read Yasin. And then we split up, and then Imam Dawood found the young man huddling uh, up the trail. So all's well that ends well. But I was hiking in Vancouver, and we came upon a, a, ro a roaring river. And, and not a large river, but the volume of water was incredible, and it was, the current was so powerful. And I was just thinking that this mighty river, if one of us would have fallen in, that was, we would have, been, would have been swept away. There's no doubt about it. Uh, started with a single drop of water. And then that drop was joined by other drops. And then they formed little rivulets and streams. And they came together. And eventually they formed that mighty river. And so all of us, through the little things we do, can be like those drops of water. Each and every one of us, if we just started recycling, if we started reusing our utensils, if we stopped using pampers and started wipe, washing our diapers again and using the uh, baby's fertilizer for fertilizer <laughs> and to provide some nitrogen to our compost, you know, they're little things, but if enough of us are doing them, they add up to that mighty river. That makes a huge difference. And we have that potential. Hopefully this conference, this workshop rather, will help to actualize uh, that potential. There's a relationship, Allah Ta'ala reminds us, that in their wealth there's a well-defined right for those who ask than those who are prevented from asking. In other words, they shouldn't have to ask for charity. But one of the consequences of our ecological crisis is that it disproportionately affects the poor people. Right here in Oakland, we know the most polluted neighborhoods are the poorest neighborhoods. In West Oakland, the pollution from the diesel, from the trucks, and the boats offloading, and the cranes, and the trucks, they're all running on diesel. And that westwardly breeze across the bay is blowing that on the people of West Oakland. And the, the health detriments are clear and well known in terms of the rates of asthma and other diseases. So disproportionately, the poor are affected. Global warming uh, is affecting the poor. Imam Afro's mentioned he knows uh, communities that have been deplaced, uh, replaced, uh, uh, displaced already as a result of the sea rising. I guarantee you they're poor communities. They're people who couldn't afford to live anywhere else. So we really have a responsibility, those of us here in what formerly was known as the first world, here in the developed West, we have a responsibility to those who can afford to do some of the things we can't afford to do, even if they wanted to. They don't have the luxury or the option. We can make a difference. And we can afford to do without certain things. Some of them, however they get their food, if their wheat is being shipped from Argentina or from Kansas, not much wheat's being shipped from Kansas this year because of the climate prob uh, problems we're experiencing. And so they have to ship their food from halfway around the world right now. We can buy local. We can do without certain things. We don't need the fruit 
the strawberries in December when locally they're harvested at the end of May, in the beginning of July, or June rather. We can do without that. And by doing without that, we can cut off the, the carbon energy that's used to ship them to us. And we can also let in people in the Philippines or wherever these crops are grown, we can let them use that land to feed themselves. Little things can make a big difference. But we have to begin to think about the implications of that. The, to move from the Qur'an, there are many, many, many verses that, that we can mention in this regard. I want to focus very quickly on an aspect of our religion referred to as the maqasid. Maqasid al-shari'a, al-shari'a. Or maqasid al-shari'a. The overarching objectives of the divine law. In other words, why was Islam sent to us as human beings in the first place? And our scholars tell us there are, there are five great objectives that the religion advances. First is the preservation of religion itself. That we were sent prophets and messengers with instruction to preserve and advance the cause of religion. Secondly, to preserve life. Thirdly, to preserve intellect. Fourthly, to preserve family. And fifthly, to preserve wealth. And some say honor as, a, as the fifth and, and instead of wealth. Some say there's six, wealth and honor. So why do I say this? If we do not take care of our environment, all of these are jeopardized. If we're living in squalid conditions, uh, polluted conditions, uh, those around us suffering from unimaginable maladies because of the lack of adequate sanitation, because of the excessive, uh, excessively polluted environment, it's very difficult to reflect on the higher spiritual realities that religion encourages in us. That's just, uh, uh, that's a fact. And for that, we, we, some, some religions use incense, aromatherapy, uh, sound therapy, light therapy, uh, pleasing colors to create an internal balance within us. And an environment that's ravaged undermines that balance. And Dr. Mahan again recited, uh, and Allah Ta'ala says, well, uh, and the sky, the heavens, he has elevated and established a balance. That you don't disrupt the balance. So there's, as we know, there's a balance between the various ecosystems. There's a balance between human life and the life of every living thing on this planet. And our Lord knows we have the ability to disrupt that balance. And so he instructs us, don't disrupt the balance that Allah Ta'ala has established. وَوَضَعَ الْمِزَانِ وَوَضَعَ اللَّهُ الْمِزَانِ Allah Almighty God has established that balance. أَلَّا تَضْغَوْ فِي الْمِزَانِ That you don't disrupt the balance. وَقِيمُ الْوَزْنَ بِالْقِسْتِ وَلَا تُخْسِرُ الْمِزَانِ And establish the, the weighing with equity and don't destroy the balance. So, we have the capability of maintaining or disrupting that balance. If we disrupt it, we disrupt our ability to really appreciate and foster the true, deeper meanings of religion and religious consciousness. We threaten naturally life. So the religion advances and preserves life. We threaten our intellects. And, and, and both directly and indirectly. Directly, uh, we take lead and we put it in our paints and everything and our children nibble on it and then their brains start to develop in wrong ways. And they have learning disabilities. So our aql, our intellect, is directly threatened by our lack of environmental consciousness and stewardship. And in many, many indirect ways, we threaten the family. Because again, as if our environment's ravaged, if our land can't grow food, 
if our fields cannot produce, if our fish have been killed off, as they are being rapidly, our fish stocks are rapidly being killed off and depleted, then this leads to massive migration. And massive migration is one of the greatest causes for tearing families apart. And many uh, refugees and immigrants know the reality of that. And then he says, uh, or, or they, the scholars they mention, uh, prop wealth. The land is the source of our wealth. The seas are the source of our wealth. So if the land and the sea is corrupted, then our ability to produce is severely undermined. How many of our fishing communities that sea was the source of their wealth have been, have been shut down? Not just in developing countries like Somalia, which has a very long coastline, but in places like Newfoundland, Maine, Massachusetts. The great banks were closed to commercial fishing off the coast of Newfoundland. So we have a responsibility if we're serious about uh, uh, advancing and preserving those great overarching objectives of the divine law to protect our environment and to work for environmental consciousness and to be very, very careful how we tread on this earth. We have a responsibility. In conclusion, I'd like to just briefly mention why does Zaytuna College, why are we so happy and honored to be co-sponsors of this program and to be the host of this program? Because this is where the rubber meets the road. We can talk about traditional education in theory, but it's in programs like this and the work that will come out of this program, inshallah, that's where the rubber meets the road. Because that's where we begin to revive traditions that have sustained us both as Muslims and in a wider sense as human beings. We have always recycled as human beings and as Muslims. We've reused things. We have always ha engaged in organic farming. We've always uh, engaged, uh, for example, in, see my notes here, integrated communities. We've always been people who have grown our produce locally. This is the reality of our condition. And these were the foundations of traditional communities. And so if we're an institution that focuses, focuses on traditional knowledge, reviving traditional knowledge, the next step is to translate that into traditional living and reviving wholesome traditions that, under, that were the, the buttresses of a sustainable ecology. And so this is why we take great, great uh, pride and we're deeply honored to host this workshop and we pray that it will be a step forward in creating sustainable communities and encouraging locally grown produce, starting in our own backyards and encouraging uh, looking at alternative ways to feed ourselves in terms of our meat, hunting where we don't have to dig up acres of land, cut down forests, uh, both to provide grazing land or to, to grow soybeans or cor corn to feed the meat that we eat in, in such uh, extravagant excess. We won't have to worry about uh, the concentrations of thousands of, of uh, tens of thousands of pigs or cows in one area where the the manure itself becomes an ecological disaster. Whereas the deer running in the forest, you have a few drops here, a few drops there, but not a hundred tons in one place that's usually dumped into the local river. So all of these things collectively, and many, many others that we didn't mention, collectively these will bring, help us to restore sanity to our lives, sanity to our communities, 
sanity to our nation and sanity to our world in terms of how we interact with our environment. So we thank all of you for your support, presenters, organizers, uh, panelists, and our audience members. We thank all of you. May Allah Ta'ala inspire you to start doing those little things, to become one of those little drops that will join the others. And inshallah ta'ala, if Almighty Allah wills, we will form that great river and we will carve out valleys of sane, sustainable living. We will cause, carve out valleys of ecological consciousness. We'll carve out valleys of 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 sound living practices that will impact our world, inshallah ta'ala. So thank you for your patience. May Allah ta'ala bless all of you. May he bless your families. May he bless all of these wonderful young people who have sat here so patiently, such as this young man in the front, who's either Mu'min Sami or Abdullah. Sami. Allah <laughs> Akbar. So, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Paris Academy, Munan Nazar from Silicon Valley Academy. Ahlan wa sahlan. We trust that Berkeley, the GTU, and Zaytuna will find a cozy place in your hearts. This is not only one of the most vibrant intellectual centers of the country, it also has a thriving and diverse Muslim population. Countless halal stores and houses of curry, dood pati, and some of the best weather of any place on earth. Send us your students to study here. Before I introduce Imam Daud Yassin to tell us a little more about the workshop, and also to introduce Imam Zaid, let me thank the many people who contributed to making this event possible. And there are a lot of people to thank. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Salim Ali, professor at the University of Vermont and director of the University's Institute for Environmental Diplomacy and Security. Dr. Salim contacted me last year on the recommendation of Imam Daoud with his vision for this workshop. Most importantly, his institution and network of sponsors and donors are funding the entire program. Thank you, Dr. Salim. In spite of the many tasks and priorities for the hardworking Zaytuna staff in its inaugural years, such as curriculum design, accreditation, the building of an endowment, and purchase of a permanent campus, which we managed to accomplish and is right next door, the college's academic affairs committee was enthusiastic about the program and eager to facilitate its success. We appreciate the support of the college's administration in promoting the event. A special note of thanks to Sumaira Akhtar. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تطغوا في الميزان وأقيموا الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسروا الميزان والأرض وضعها للأنام فيها فاكهة والنخل ذات الأكمام والحب ذو العصف والريحان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان صدق الله العظيم In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. The all merciful has taught the Quran. He created humankind and he has taught eloquent speech. 
the sun and the moon to a reckoning, and the stars and the trees bow themselves. And heaven, he raised it up and set the balance. Transgress, transgress not in the balance and weigh with justice and skimp not in the balance. And earth, he set it down for all beings. Therein fruits and palm trees with sheaths and grain in the blade and fragrant herbs. Oh, which of your Lord's bounties will you and you deny? Imam Zaid, Imam Daoud, respected guests and participants, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Greetings of peace. On behalf of Zaytuna College and with these ayat of the Quran from Surah Ar Rahman, the All Merciful, I welcome you to the launch of an experiential environmental workshop, a four day program directed by Imam Daoud Yasin and chaired by Dr. Salim Ali, who will be joining us tomorrow. Zaytuna is happy to be hosting this workshop in partnership with the University of Vermont's Institute for Environmental Diplomacy and Security and the Graduate Theological Union's Center for Islamic Studies. The ultimate goal of any educational institution should be to nurture individuals, not simply as means to someone else's ends, but to be ends in themselves. At Zaytuna, we like to say that our education is not about making a living, it is preparation for a life worth living. It is ultimately in this way that we will better society, further the common good, and make the world more hospitable for our children. This imperative lies at the heart of an institution such as the GTU as well, whose very motto declares that Holy Hill is a place where religion meets the world. And the mission of Zaytuna College is to educate and prepare morally committed professional, intellectual, and spiritual leaders who are grounded in the Islamic scholarly tradition and conversant with the cultural currents and critical ideas shaping modern society. It is for the training and nurturing of leaders that we are gathered here today. It is indeed our pleasure to welcome participants from across the United States, leaders in their respective institutions already, to spend the week with us Catherine Piper from Islamic Society of Boston Cultural Center in Massachusetts. Muhammad Aftab Diwan from Brighter Horizons Academy in Texas. Bertina Naba from Nashville International Academy in Tennessee. Azra Ali, Huda School in Michigan. Hajira Himayatullah and Sayyid Amanullah from Crescent Academy International, also in Michigan, from Michigan. And from right here in the Bay Area, Salwa Abid from North Star School. Muniza Ahsan from Peace Temp, our dedicated academics program manager. Her brothers from all the way in Chicago and DC have also contributed. Usman is responsible for designing the lovely poster and bookmarks that you see. And Rizwan is representing Green Muslims as a presenter. You will hear from him shortly. We have also been blessed with two wonderful volunteers who the participants will be seeing all week. Aaron Choi, president of the Green Khalifa Club. That's a club at Zaytuna College. Aaron, raise your hand. Thank you, Aaron. Remarkable individual. He's been doing tremendous work. And also Rawan Abu Sha'ban, an accomplished freshman at UC Berkeley and active volunteer at the local masjid. Rawan's sister Noor is also here today to help. Thank you to all the volunteers. Thanks also to the many community members who have pitched in for lunches and dinners throughout the week. Amina Jandali, Babar and Shama Khan, Abbas and Ruxana Mirza, my parents. <laughs> as well as the business Cream and Cheese and Stuff Delhi. E.B. Bai and Halima, wonderful family friends and longtime supporters of the GTU, are not only providing a dinner for the participants on Friday, they've also catered this reception to their new venture, Kokum Cuisine. Thanks to them. A warm note of appreciation for Phil Pasquini. He's the one, not quite walking around yet, but with the impressive camera, almost as impressive as his mustache. <laughs> I asked him if I could say that. He said yes. <laughs> Which he has used with great skill, not the mustache, the camera.